Meanwhile, back in America, the FAA is smothering the National Space Program in this Kafka-esque paperwork. That's Elon's warning to the FAA while sharing a video of China's spacesuits and their plans to get to the moon by 2030. It is truly alarming that China could get there before the U.S. if the FAA continues their stubborn ways, restricting star flights in Texas. We cannot let that happen. Worst case scenario, SpaceX should launch Starship in Florida to ensure its strong development. How many advantages would Starship have if SpaceX launched in Florida? What did Florida's Gov just do with SpaceX's Starship? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. And thanks for being here. When the legal barriers are tormenting SpaceX in Texas, particularly environmental restrictions, it's led to frustrations for folks like Elon and Shotwell. First, they were angry with the FAA, and then impatience set in when the FAA replied to SpaceX's evidence in an unsatisfactory, even a false manner. Not just SpaceX we're talking, many members of the House, Senate, and others within the space industry are also pretty displeased with how the agency is handling the situation. Sadly, despite all efforts, the results have not improved much. SpaceX's fifth flight at its Starbase is still delayed. The FAA is stubbornly sticking to its guns. And this raises the question of whether future development of Starship can be assured if SpaceX stays in Texas or if they need to move to another site where they can do more frequent launches without having to wait months for permits. Quite frankly, if SpaceX is forced to change up their plans, no place would be more suitable than Florida's coast for Starship's new launch site. While SpaceX has dubbed Texas the gateway to Mars, Florida is considered by the entire space community to be the space hub, as nearly 78% of all rocket launches happen there. In a record-setting year, 72 orbital rockets were launched from Florida's space coast in 2023, surpassing the previous record of 57 launches set in 2022, with SpaceX's Falcon 9 rockets making up the majority of the missions. Florida's coast has long been the golden land for rocket launches in the U.S., not to mention incentives provided by local government for the busiest launch site. The geographic location is also really ideal for orbital launches. The launch area on the east coast near the equator plays a crucial role. Rockets can safely launch eastward over the vast waters of the Atlantic, and if something goes wrong with a rocket after liftoff, spaceflight operators can land safely in the Atlantic Ocean without endangering the public. SpaceX has taken advantage of this by positioning a floating platform in the Atlantic where the first stage of the Falcon 9 can land after delivering payloads to space. Some rockets also return to Florida's coast where they land just a couple miles from where they were launched minutes earlier. This prime location benefits from Earth's rotation, creating eastward velocity that helps the rocket gain momentum during liftoff. This eastward velocity, known as rotational velocity, peaks near the equator, helping rockets accelerate toward their intended orbit. And this saves fuel that would otherwise be used to achieve the appropriate speed. As a result, rockets launched out of Florida can send a heavier spacecraft or satellite into space. Moreover, launching from Florida allows rockets to take advantage of Earth's curvature. As rockets move east, they can use the Earth's curvature to achieve altitude more efficiently. Those are the geological advantages, but what about the environmental regulations at the launch sites in Florida? Are they easier than those in Texas, as we might think? Okay, so if SpaceX were to launch Starship from the NASA lease launch facilities in Florida, the delays in permits would probably improve. According to what Elon has previously revealed, SpaceX already received environmental approval for Starship launches from Kennedy, and the company's resumed work on a launch site for Starship LC-39A adjacent to the pad currently used by Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Therefore, it can be said that once SpaceX completes the Starship launch tower at LC-39A, Starship could quickly start launching from there. However, it's still unclear whether the previous environmental assessment for Starship at Kennedy will need to be updated to account for the vehicle's current config, which has evolved significantly since that assessment got complete. Nevertheless, the FAA's oversight at this location is significantly reduced. This is because the Florida coast includes legally established launch complexes already operated by NASA. The U.S. government has built, operated, and maintained satellite infrastructure there since the 1950s. The majority of demand and use of these sites traditionally came from U.S. civil and military government agencies. After the Challenger disaster, a White House decision in 86 allowed launch customers to bid directly from launch vehicle manufacturers, who would then rent the launch facilities from NASA or the U.S. Air Force. The launchpad industry, which is the focus of this regulation, has also made progress. Commercial launch operations began with a goal of providing flexible and cost-effective facilities for both existing and new launch vehicles. As the commercial launch pad industry began, commercial launch companies primarily based their launch ops at federal launch sites operated by the Department of Defense and NASA. 
the Federal Launch Site provides the advantage of existing launch infrastructure and range safety services. Launch companies like SpaceX, ULA, and Blue Origin can receive several services from Federal Launch Sites, including radar, tracking and telemetry, flight termination, and other launch services. Today, most commercial launches still happen from Federal Launch Sites. However, this model may change as other launch sites, like private ones such as SpaceX's Starbase, become more prevalent. Whether a rocket launches from a government or private launch site, the launch operator is still responsible for the ground and flight safety under its FAA license. The simpler process is when safety rules, procedures, and practices combined with the safety functions of the government's federal range, such as NASA's launch facilities, have already been reviewed by the FAA and found to meet most of the FAA's safety concerns. In contrast, when launching from a non-governmental site, the launch operator's responsibility for ground and flight safety becomes more critical. In the absence of government range oversight, each launch operator is responsible for proving the adequacy of their ground and flight safety to the FAA. That's why SpaceX conducts Starship launches at NASA lease facilities. The FAA's authority at those sites is significantly reduced compared to what we're seeing in Texas. Aside from the more streamlined permit process, Florida's government is also warmly welcoming private rocket launch companies to the Space Coast, especially SpaceX. Last year, Florida Gov Ron DeSantis signed a space-related bill. The new law could protect Elon and other spaceflight companies from lawsuits over accidents causing injury or death to crew members. While this law might not exactly relate to environmental permits, we know Ron DeSantis has been a strong advocate for the state space sector and has also supported the Trump admin in removing some of those space regulations. It's hard not to believe that the Florida government is quietly supporting Elon and SpaceX with regulatory benefits rather than just lip service. With all these factors, Florida Space Coast has proven to be the ideal place for SpaceX to do multiple launches right now without too much concern about the FAA. SpaceX has to change, and Starship needs to launch quickly, or else the U.S. could lag behind China in the race to the moon in the next few years. China's space program is developing systematically in a consistent and integrated manner. Their missions don't seem to face serious technical issues that other projects have encountered, or perhaps we're just not told about them. Regardless, China's got a strategic plan to build a space economy and become the global leader in space exploration. The South Pole of the Moon has been designated as the site for a future International Lunar Research Station, which is led by China. They intend to explore and then mine resources from asteroids and celestial bodies like the Moon using lunar ice and any other useful space resources available within the solar system. China's goal is to explore the moon first, followed by near-Earth objects, then later move on to Mars, the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and then the moons of Jupiter. They plan to use stable gravitational points in space called Lagrange points for other space stations. Out of China's next steps in this strategy, the Chang'e 7's robotic mission is scheduled to launch in 2026. It will land on the sunlit rim of the Shackleton Crater near the moon's south pole. The rim of this large crater has a point of continuous sunlight in an area where the sun's angle creates long shadows obscuring much of the landscape. This is a bold move, as the U.S. also has ambitions to establish bases on the moon's south pole, Shackleton Crater being prime real estate. A later mission, Chang'e's 8, currently planned no later than 2028, aims to mine ice and other resources, demonstrating that they can be used to support human outposts. Both Chang'e 7 and 8 are considered part of the ILRS and will set the stage for China's impressive exploration program. Compared to China's swift and decisive actions, Starship, the key player in getting astronauts to the moon, is being shackled by the FAA for reasons no one recognizes. Honestly, it is quite disheartening to see parts of the U.S. government holding back the country's progress. This delay is an embarrassment, to say the least. While NASA's timeline for getting back to the moon may slip even further, China could carry out their plans to send humans to the moon by 2030. Indeed, some commenters have wondered if this Asian superpower might actually beat the U.S. in the race to return to the moon. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for watching and see you next time.